As politics become more divisive and the world has to respond to new threats every day, it can be all too easy to turn away. And yet our generation has a new wave of thought leaders. This discussion brings together those who are here to prove that no matter the obstacle, and no matter your age, you can leave behind a world that is better than when you found it. This is Complex Conversations. Growth out of chaos. I'd like to know what is like the one word that you use to describe sort of what's happening in the world right now? Kind of hopeless. People feel really hopeless. I think for some of us who are working uh, to dismantle this oppression are hopeful. But the people that we are advocating for who see this on the news, they feel hopeless. Like, how can we change this? We lost the Supreme Court. We have Orangey in the White House. We don't have a lot of governors that care about us. And people are kind of hopeless. And so I hope that we're able to have this conversation about growing out of chaos and inspiring people to be hopeful in this chaotic moment. There is a reminder, James Baldwin said, would you actually like to integrate into a burning house? And so I feel like if anything, what this year has shown all of us is that we can't integrate, we have to recreate the system. I think the one word that just keeps ringing in my head is potential. Like this is the time where absolutely anything is possible for the good and the bad, and we've seen that. I was talking to my young siblings about, I'm the oldest of five, and they finally have a platform where they have access to people like you, where they can learn from you guys and they can see that they can see themselves in it. And I grew up in a place where I never saw myself in, any, in anything because we didn't really have social media then. And on television, there was never anybody who looked like me. And now everybody has that potential now. There's so much, people ask a lot about like, how do we talk to people about this world that we live in? Like, how do we like equip people with like the skills to talk about the world or like to do something? The one thing I do is I have an amazing support network of people to turn to because I know it comes from an understanding that I do not know everything. No one stepped into this knowing how to do it all. And so I think this, this hyper critique of one another is not useful because you end up turning so many people away instead of actively using our power. And, and so it's by creating a support network of people that you trust that can constantly help you expand. And whether that be family or teachers or people that you meet on the internet or whoever it may be. I mean, be careful of people you meet on the internet. But like I'm saying verifiable people. And, and ultimately, I think just in terms of remaining purpose driven, I, I think the one thing that I've started saying now just in terms of receiving pushback is like, I don't need the devil or his advocate. So why would I engage in this conversation? <laughs> This time on like a different set of issues. Jaden, let's start with you. How did you get involved in the environmental activism? How did you start the water company? Like what was, what was the pathway to that? There's just so many different devastating things that are happening with the environment. So I feel like what really put me on my journey was exposure and education. And I feel like that's what the most important thing is right now because everybody cares. Everybody wants to be a superhero. Everybody wants to help. So we just don't know how and we won't know how until we learn how. I'm constantly seeing water bottles. That's what's in the ocean. That's what's in the landfills. That's what's on the street. Um, that's what's putting the CO2 emissions that are going into the air. So that's why I want to create a water bottle company. It wasn't because it's what people were using and that was a good marketing. It was because that was the biggest polluter and that's what I was seeing. And when I was 11, that's, that's what my inspiration was. Alente, what about you? What is, how did you get involved in the work of Planned Parenthood? And what is it about Planned Parenthood that you think people don't know? In 2012, I was on the campaign to reelect our forever president, Barack Obama. <laughs> and um, do, the work that I was doing was actually surrogate work and getting the right messengers out there with the message. I was working with a lot of our friend Michael Skolnick and getting a lot of hip hop artists to talk about a message that they weren't listening to their congressmen talk about. Planned Parenthood called to want to do the same thing about reaching black communities through communication strategies. So I said, okay, I can connect with this issue, especially as a black woman who understands how having access to birth control and cancer treatments, all of these uh, reproductive health care issues actually allow me to have the opportunities that I've been afforded to have. There's this connection to our economic empowerment that just being able to take care of yourself has, right? We're fighting against police brutality. We're fighting for a fair justice system and voting rights. Actually having healthcare is 
a form of agency. The broader issues that we're fighting for, for voting rights, again, environmental justice, economic justice, education, all the people attacking those are also attacking my ability to have agency over my body. And that's why I'm proud to work at Planned Parenthood, especially as a black woman, when we are not centered in the conversation around women. So, Jaden, I remember when you wore, we all remember when you wore the skirt, and there were some people who were like, why is he doing that? What does this mean? Like, I never got that. You didn't? No, that was a joke. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I heard people say it. Okay. How do you deal with the pushback? Like, what, what is your response? Like, and how do you keep moving forward in the midst of it? I appreciate people that challenge my ideas because that helps me grow. But at the end of the day, like, if I want to wear a skirt, bro, like, I'm going to wear one and I'm going to look fly. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I look, I was looking fly. Like, I wasn't even trying to be an activist. I was really just trying to look fly. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and so as far as pushback and as far as anybody else out in the audience that like, gets any pushback, it's like, we don't have time for that. We're not at, we don't have time. We have to move right now. There's things that we have to do. The world is changing. We have to change with it. People are pushing back. They're gonna get left behind because we're only pushing forward right now. I believe that you can define your purpose by combining the things that pain you with your skills and your talent. So like in journalism school, I was never taught to go into a scene or whatever story I was covering and ask myself, how is the way that I'm going to cover this going to impact the community I'm talking about? And I had to learn that the hard way because time and time again in the newsroom, I saw the way people were covering the Muslim community or the Arab American community. I found this thing that I had never learned in school before, but I learned because I realized how my community was being harmed by the people in my industry. And I realized this job at local, I was working in a at a local news television station at the time, um, wasn't where I needed to be. And I had worked my entire life to get to this place, but where I needed to be was in the communities that I felt were often misrepresented. And the cause that I realized that pained me was the misrepresentation of minority communities in America. And so I realized, you know what, if the people around me aren't going to be telling these stories, then I'm going to be telling them. And I realized I could tap into the things that had pained me or that I had gone through. And even if I didn't relate to someone, I was able to tell I was able to gain their trust because I could go to them and say, hey, I know what it's like to be misrepresented. I'm not gonna take your story and I'm not gonna run with it. Run with it. You can trust me. And I was immediately able to build that kind of trust. There was one person that I interviewed for my documentary who was this trans Latina woman. Afterwards, I jumped into the cab with my producer and videographer and my producer looked at me and was like, Everybody at the end of every interview that you do says like, wow, like I've never told you this or ends up opening up to you. Like we really need more hijabi journalists. It's not that we're not there. It's that people won't hire us. Like I have a list of people who literally told me like they wouldn't hire me because of what I was wearing on my head and missed out on the potential of how great of a storyteller I am. I always try to go into a story like reminding myself that whoever is going to tell me their story right now, like, I'm not entitled to this. This is a privilege and an honor. Like they don't owe me their story. And it becomes a responsibility on the storytellers and not just in journalism, but in music and media and film and fashion, whatever it is, to make sure like we're not afraid to speak up when we realize like, hey, something just doesn't look right here. We are on the ground warriors. Like our voice is our power. My voice is my power. And I won't let anybody take that away from me or you. Yeah, you started 18 by 18. What led to that? Like, what was the impetus behind this idea that you wanted to be active in a different way? It started because after the 2016 election, I was too young to vote myself, but I escorted my parents to the polls, did everything I possibly could as a 16-year-old who couldn't vote, and there was still this overarching feeling of um, not only seeing the results of the election, but in realizing how quickly policy can be emplaced and then removed, and how quickly um, 
that policy can go from celebrating humans to literally suppressing them. And more than that, the importance that culture plays in that and the importance of a culture of social engagement. And so 18 by 18 really stemmed from two things. One, wanting to increase voter turnout and voter registration, but two, ending the cycle of um, political jargon, which makes it hard for people to even engage in politics. And it's cyclical because if you get the same people to vote, you have the same results. And so if you get people to be excluded from the conversation actively, then you you don't have to worry about their voices. And I mean, ultimately, I've heard many people say this, and I believe it's true that if voting wasn't powerful, people wouldn't be actively trying to take it away from you. And so understanding how important policy is in the foundation of our communities and whether we have the opportunity to thrive or whether we are relegated to merely surviving means that voting is everything. What are some of the stories that we should be telling in a better way that we like, haven't figured out how to tell in public yet? What's on your mind in that realm? I think a story that first comes to mind is a story that made a really big impact on me, Sonny's Blues, short story by James Baldwin. What I loved about it so much is that it's not as though we are completely lacking on stories of suppressed communities, but the way Baldwin does it is in, I don't know if this makes any sense, but I was reading about Harlem and it was in Renaissance colors. It was in Renaissance gold. So to be able to have the duality of acknowledging the fact that we have been repressed, suppressed in any way possible while still not taking away our humanity and our ability to celebrate ourselves, I think there's a certain, again, going back to the conversation around agency, there's a conversation of you can't take away people's complexity. And so many times we have to tell one story or the other, the story of how we celebrate each other or thrive or the story of how we're suppressed. And it's the merger of both, which is going to be and continues to be and proves to be so powerful. It's so funny you say that because Invisible Man is the book I read in like my senior year in high school and I did a paper on it and it was about a black man in Harlem during the Renaissance and just that juxtaposition of you're so oppressed in the early 1900s, but Harlem was, is the black mecca. It's the reason I moved there when I moved to New York. And as I think about black women's stories and where we sit with this political power, like if you want to win a campaign, you either get a black woman to run the campaign or you make sure all the black women are voting because you will win. But as we are winning campaigns and we have all this political power and economic buying power, we still have the poorest healthcare outcomes in one of the greatest, supposedly, greatest countries in the world. We're still dying at three to four times the rate of white women in childbirth. And so how do you show those stories on television and film and short stories? And so people actually look at this and figure out how do we champion black women and stand with black women and all the complexities and the beauty? A lot of that is having black women behind the scenes creating these stories, right? So we have to normalize this culture, especially around marginalized communities. And if we're talking about sexuality, it can't just be male, female. We have to have gender non-conforming stories there. We have to have transgender representation. We have to talk through what does it mean to be masculine or feminine and show that and live in it. And I, I'm hopeful that culture, as we are sitting here having the conversations, we're talking about activism and, key, and critical issues, that folks who are creating culture realize the role that they play in those stories. Coming from a multicultural family, I had a supplementary education of what wasn't taught in classrooms. I naturally was able to turn to my Khalez in Iran and talk about their stories. I was able to turn to my papa and learn about his work. Within history, it's not only severely Eurocentric, like I was an eight-year-old who had the, the hard copy of like the biography of Napoleon Bonaparte. You were taught to relate to people who in no way were taught to relate to you. When you look at this severe othering, it stemmed from how we learn about each other. And when you look at first world countries determining where they will send aid, they're not even recognizing the role that they've played in withdrawing every resource that country has. And so we're not taught to connect, we're taught to separate that. We're taught to say that movements in India in no way affected me. And we're not taught to look at Steve Biko as somebody who affected my ability to exist. And I think in restructuring that, we could inherently restructure how we relate to one another on a foundational level. I want my kids to like learn from you one day. <laughs> my husband, no, no joke, literally probably, I think last week or the week before my husband and I had an entire conversation about like how I'm terrified to send my kids to school one day because of history class and because I grew up feeling the exact same way that you did and just like, I was never able to relate to anybody and 
I recently learned about how much was just missing of, from our history books purposely, and it's just like criminal almost. That's what they're doing in Texas, right? Like th that's why voting yeah. for your, and I'm, I know we keep going back to voting and voting isn't sexy, but like you vote for people on the school board because the people on the school board are determining what books are being in elementary and high yeah. schools. I wish voting wasn't so hard. And Jamel Hill put it on Instagram, and I love when she said it. She was like, if, if your vote didn't matter, why are they fighting so hard to suppress it? Young people, people of color, low-income folks, people power is on the rise, and so they are fighting as hard as they can to suppress that vote. And so I wish that as soon as you turn 18, whether you are a citizen, an immigrant, or not an immigrant, if you live in the United States, you should be able to vote for the people that represent you. When I'm not able to live freely and have access to all of the opportunity that is supposed to be afforded to me because I live in supposedly the greatest country in the world, then I actually need to change the system in which I live in. And the way to start doing that, it's voting. Voting isn't the only way to do that, but that's step one. And then you hold those people accountable, and then you organize against them if they don't have your best interests at heart. But I really wish that voting wasn't so stigmatized and that it was this older people thing to do, it was this white people thing to do. I was sitting in, uh, uh, sitting in my hotel room, um, and I saw that this church I used to go to in Northern Virginia, uh, a black church, Baptist church, there was a bomb threat there last night. And I sat there and I thought about my grandmother who passed in 2014. And she, one of the last things she said to me um, when I was holding her hand in the hospital was that I fought for all of this stuff, for women's rights, for civil rights, so you didn't have to keep going, baby girl. And when I read that, because that church had hit home, right? Like sometimes issues don't, don't impact us until we know somebody there or until we know, you know that community or whatever it is. And I was like, is this what my grandmother was going through in her 20s or in her 30s? Is this what she was going through? And I, she kind of just spoke to me at that time and just said, stay hopeful and be courageous because we can change this. In groups of people who like share common goals and values, it's actually like the most minor differences that create this sense of strangeness and hostility. And it's something that I've experienced with my own community, and I think every community at some point experiences it, which is basically like counterproduct counterproductivity because um, if you like are a part of this community or you're a, a part of this group and there's like tension within each other or people throw each other shade or you're hating on each other because one person isn't enough or isn't like, perfect enough for this value that you carry or this message that you carry, you end up just like pushing people away who share the same fundamental values that you share. And it's, um, and it's so prevalent, I, especially I feel like in minority communities, instead of oftentimes cheering each other on, you see the people who look like you being the ones who are the most critical of you. If you can have these open and honest conversations with your own communities and be like, hey, like, at the end of the day, we don't have to be the exact same person. We don't have to do things the exact same way. Like I, in, t in 2016, I did an interview. I was profiled as a renegade in Playboy magazine. And I was fully clothed, obviously. Um, but the whole world flipped upside down. And like a humongous part of my community went to like rip my throat out. And I went and like I did the interview in the magazine just to talk about like this message that I've been sharing to a group of people who had oftentimes like never heard a Muslim woman speak before. And those were like the emails that I was getting, but it's just like, instead of you focusing on the fact that like you wouldn't personally do this, um, can we talk about the fact that like, hey, we're getting into spaces that we were never welcomed in before. Being able to be like, hey, you can do it. And like affirm to people that like you have that potential. And I think that we have to take ownership and responsibility in our own communities and root for each other. I feel like at times, sometimes that pushback comes from a lack of understanding and awareness. And I took all of the stuff that people like to say about Planned Parenthood and black folks. First of all, I want black people, I want black folks, I want LGBTQ folks, I want marginalized folks and forgotten about folks to live. And part of that is having access to health care and determining what happens to your body. And Planned Parenthood is a resource for that. And so when people talk about our founding or abortion rights or whatever it is, I actually just said, let me study for myself. Get some wisdom for myself. That's what the Bible taught me. So I said, let me figure this out myself. And I found that what is trying to divide people of color from understanding reproductive freedom and owning it were actually evangelical white men in like the 60s and the 70s who were trying to, again, take back another form of liberation. 
And I said, so I'm not going to let not only people who don't look like me or never have my experience, but also the hoteps that believe in this. <laughs> it's true. And y'all know a lot, and that's why some of y'all aren't laughing, because y'all know a lot of them. Um, I'm not going to let you all take away a resource that is literally saving people's lives. People take birth control not to prevent pregnancy. There are a lot of people, reasons that people take birth control from actual health care reasons, from fibroids or whatever it is, as a preventative medicine. So as we, as we come to a close, I want to end with, like, how do we, like, equip people with, like, the skills to talk about the world or, like, to do something? What advice do you have for people who are nervous about taking a stand? I, like, growing up, had to learn to... to realize that sometimes you will disagree with the people that you love in your communities. Um, and a lot of it is rooted in like what people don't know. Going into conversations, like intentionally listening and not just to respond to somebody. Um, and finding commonality is really important to me because I, f I think that the most productive conversations come from people feeling like, oh, hey, I can relate to this person. Even in those most like tense, dark conversations, just find that point of commonality and still try to emerge with kindness. And if you feel like there's a place, it's a place where you are either in danger or you are feeling hurt or you are feeling like you cannot be kind at the moment, just walk away from it because it's never worth your mental health and, um, and the feeling of tension in your heart. My advice to you is that the only thing that is truly stopping you from creating the world that you want to create is the idea in your head that you are not good enough. And I'm here to tell you that you are a limitless creator and everything that has been created in the world has been created by somebody who is just like you. So I'm excited to see what you make. Boom. Thank you, let's give it up for Yara, Noor, Alencia, Jaden. Thank you everybody.